Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Pastor Mark. Happy birthday to you. All right, and children, you are dismissed to junior church. Very good. Yes, that I'll fly away is feeling closer and closer. <laughs> yes, yeah, I was going to mention it's hard to even turn to pages in the Bible with all the, my birthday cards in here. They're feeling heavy, too, so that's, that's always a good sign. Okay, in um, John chapter 15 is what we're going to look at today. John chapter 15. I'm going to read verses um, 1 through 5. John 15, 1 through 5. Give you a little perspective on life. Um, if you are feeling a little bit old today, don't... I'm not my perspective. John Martin, who attends our traditional service, he turns 100 um, a week from tomorrow. So just, uh, in fact, there's a celebration at Peter Piper Pete's on Saturday. I'm serious about that. It's in the bulletin. You can join him at, um, for his 100th celebration at Peter Piper. John 15, verses 1 through 5. <clears throat> I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He, cu he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him... He will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. I'm going to talk about this idea of bearing fruit um, in a little bit. I wanted to give a little perspective of, to actually understand uh, a little bit about what Jesus is talking about um, by talking about grace. Um, we've, we've been touching on that a little bit, and I want to um, keep that idea fresh in our minds. So before we can get to the point of bearing fruit, we need to really look at kind of a some foundation thoughts in our minds about our relationship with the Lord. And I want to, what I want to do is kind of, to begin with, look at some scenarios, look at some ideas, thoughts that we have in our minds that it's easy in our lives as we've been a part of the church for a long time. It's easy to get certain types of thoughts in your mind about what it means to follow God, what it means to become a Christian, what it means to go to heaven, all those things, it's, it's easy to get some kind of different ideas that we really need to make sure that we're not going through life believing these myths, um, but that we understand the truth that comes from Scripture. So I'll just give you some ideas that I think, because of talking to people that have been raised in the church, some ideas I think that people have about their relationship with God. Here's, a, here's one scenario. You are raised in the church, and you think you're pretty good. Um, you don't do bad stuff. You live a good life. You probably can't remember ever not being a Christian. You just have always followed God, always been a part of the church, always you know, tried to live this good life, this life that you know, you're supposed to live. Be careful. You need the grace of God. Another one. You recognize some point in your life that you weren't living right. You, you, know, you realize you were making wrong decisions um, in your life. You knew you needed to you know, straighten up your life a little bit. So um, you made a conscious decision. I need to, you know, I need to straighten up my life. I need, to, I need to live better. I need to do better. And you know, it's kind of like, well, maybe in our culture we recognize that kind of goes along with going to church. And so you made a decision in your life that I'm going to live a better life and I'm going to go to church. So you did. You cleaned up your life. You became active in the church. Be careful. You need the grace of God. There's another one I think that people think. You realized you were a sinner. Someone told you to clean up your life and accept Christ. And so you did. 
You cleaned up your life. You've tried your best to live for God. You recognize you're not perfect, uh, but you've, you've just done all you can in your life to try to please him. So that, and, and as you think about it right now, you are hoping that you will be considered good enough to be able to get to heaven. Be careful. You need the grace of God. You know, there are lies that circulate within the church about what it means to come to Christ, what it means to live for Christ. And it's not that people are just trying to make up these lies. The devil wants to deceive. That's what he wants to do. He just wants us to get thinking about different things in our lives. And, you know, it's interesting. You know, you'll, you'll talk to people and maybe you'll hear about an evangelism. You'll go up to somebody and you'll say, you know, do you feel like if you died right now you'd go to heaven? And, and you know, questions like that. I actually pose those questions to church people because... I, I think a lot of times we have to really think, you know, we have to really examine what do I believe about my salvation. And I have asked people within the church and I've talked about this idea with people in the church about if, you, you know, when you die or if you die, you know, or if, if you feel like something's coming up soon or whatever, are you sure that you're going to go to heaven? And there's a, there are many people in the church, folks, in the church who will answer, I hope so. I hope I've done enough good things. I hope God can be pleased with you know, what I've done with my life. Or I hope I haven't committed some sin that he's going to hold against me. And people give these answers when they respond to that question. And really it's the kind of the basic question that we really need to make sure we understand. And we start coming up with all these different ideas. We need to remember the grace of God. As we think about um, the truth of Scripture, I just want to share a couple of thoughts with you today that we'll get into this idea of bearing fruit, but we really need to begin with an understanding of God's grace in our lives and what that means so that we can build that foundation and then go from there. So let me just share a couple of truths with you from Scripture. Number one, God saves you. You don't save yourself. We need to remember that because it's very easy in the church, especially if we have been brought up with some sort of church background, to think that we have some part in this salvation thing, that, that we're, we do our part, God does his part, we put all that together, and then when it's all done, then we're saved. Uh, let's remember this. Here's a truth from the Bible. You were guilty as a sinner. Some point in your life, you recognize this, um, hopefully you've taken care of this, but some point in your life you recognize you were guilty as a sinner, you were outside of Christ. Now, whether you were raised in the church, baptized as a baby, went through the, your entire life trying to be good, whatever it is, you have to recognize your actions are not good enough. You can't undo what's been done you can't overcome by yourself this issue of guilt and sin and the need for forgiveness as a sinner you need to be saved you need to be forgiven you need to be restored with God and remember this God did all the work for your salvation again don't think that I'll do a little he'll do a little and it all be taken care of no no God did all the work for your salvation Chuck Swindoll wrote a book called the grace awakening and in that book, um, he said, the most dangerous false teaching on earth is the emphasis on what we do for God instead of what God does for us. If we're going to, you know, when we start at the very basics of our understanding of our relationship with God, we need to understand God has done everything for me. It's not about what I have done for him. He has done everything for me. Uh, if you don't understand grace, if you don't live in the grace of God, then you're going to fall into that trap of that false teaching and you're going to ask those questions. Have I done enough for God? Have I done enough for him to be pleased with me? Have I done enough for him to love me? Have I done enough for him to show me favor in my life? And if you think that, we need to talk because that is not the gospel message about what I can do to... Um, 
to get God to love me or things like that. You know, Paul in the book of Galatians talks about this group that came in and taught another gospel, which he says is no gospel at all. Another good news, another message, which is not the good news at all, he says. And he is, he is reprimanding the church and saying, don't listen to them. You guys have just switched gears and you're following this other idea because it's so important that we back up and we know, we understand the grace of God in our lives and what the good news is all about. What God has done. I know there's a whole lot more. We've talked about repentance. We've talked about the holiness of God. We've talked about all those things. But we have to make sure that we come into this relationship with God with the right understanding of what God has done and the gift that he has given to me. Paul said in scripture, you were dead in your sins and God made you alive with Christ. You were dead and God made you alive. Not you were dead and you resuscitated your life. Not that you were dead and you were able to kind of clean your act up and get things better with God. Not that you were dead and you were able to kind of somehow erase the past. No, you were dead and God made you alive. That's the message that scripture teaches us. And there's a lot more in scripture that talks about this, but we need to, and I just want to look at a, just a couple of verses um, that Paul talks about in Romans chapter 4. Um, I'm going to kind of break it up in a couple, of, in, in some sections. Romans chapter 4, verse 2 and 3, talking about Abraham. Paul says, if in fact Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. I put the Genesis 15 there because that's where that quote comes from. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Abraham was not justified by works. He wasn't, he didn't, you know, sacrifice enough, do enough, live well enough, um, follow God well enough, things like that. He didn't, he didn't do all of that to become justified by God. He was, the Bible says, justified by faith. He believed God, the promise that God made, he believed that promise, and it was credited to him as righteousness. He didn't deserve it. He didn't earn it. It was given to him, this, this statement, that you are now righteous. Abraham was a sinner, and God called him. He believed God and God took that sinner Abraham and said to Abraham, the sinner, you are righteous. Now remember, from that point on, Abraham sinned again. He didn't stop sinning. I'm sure he tried. I'm sure he, he tried to obey God, but he sinned again. But God still looked at him and said, you are righteous. I credit that to you. I give that to you. My, that's my gift to you. That's what God had done. And so we need to understand that. It's not anything that Abraham did. It was the work of God. But Paul says more in Romans chapter 4, verse 4 and 5. Now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. We know the difference between wages and a gift, right? I mean, you work a week of work, and let's say you've worked hard, and at the end of that week, you, um, you show up and your boss hands you your paycheck for that week, and as the boss is handing you that paycheck, he says, this is my gift to you because I like you so much, your wages. Now, you want to respect your boss, but somewhere in your mind, you're thinking, this is no gift. This is an obligation. Our, our agreement was, I work and you pay me. That's how it works out. There's no gift involved here. There's obligation. I'm obligated to work. You're obligated to pay me. That's how wages work. Now, at the beginning of all this, uh, Paul says, if Abraham could have worked for this righteousness, he could have bragged about it. And you know, you might do that. You might go around bragging about how hard you work and how much they deserve to pay you, maybe even pay you more, whatever. But we can brag about what we work and the wages that we earn as a result of that. But that's all obligation. But a gift, we're not obligated. Now, I know we, we have social pressures 
about giving. You know, if it's a birthday, hey, there's a birthday tomorrow. If it's a birthday, <laughs> if it's a birthday, you're obligated, you know, if you're close enough to that person, you're obligated to give them a gift, like if it's your pastor or something. No, no, I, I am totally teasing about this, I want you to know. Uh, so, so sometimes we feel the obligation. It's Christmas time. Oh, well, it's Christmas. It's a, I, I better give a gift. You know, sometimes we make ourselves feel obligated. But truly, really and truly, to give a gift, there should be no obligation. I, you know, if, if somebody comes up and gives me a gift, I should not respond by saying, well, it's about time you gave me that gift. I've really deserved that gift that, that you just gave me. I should not respond that way. We may think that way in our culture, but that's not how we should respond because a gift is something that we want to do. There's no, no obligation. You're not deserving it. It's just I want to do this because I care about you. I want you to have this. That's a gift. That's the whole attitude. Not obligation, but gift. Okay, now verse 4 and 5 talk about the differences between works and faith and wages and a gift by faith we believe that God justifies the ungodly now that's us we were the ungodly and God justified us and said you are now righteous that's my gift to you now please don't respond to God and say well good I deserve that because we didn't oh good that's your obligation no it wasn't his obligation he chose to do that. He chose through his son and what Jesus did to, by, to show grace and give us that gift. That's what God has done for us. And that's what is shown in the life of Abraham because he did it with Abraham. And we are children of Abraham because of that idea of justification by faith. That's what God has done. And he offers the same thing for us. That's grace. That's the promise of God. He will take the ungodly sinner and declare you righteous. Not by anything we have done, but by everything that he has done. God has done the work. I don't save myself. He saves me. But there's more in verses 7 and 8. Romans chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. Go ahead and jump a couple more. There you go. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against him. Again, I put Psalm 32 there because Paul is quoting from Psalm 32, just so you can see the reference in all of that in Romans chapter 4. So the question is, are you blessed today? Are you blessed? Are your transgressions forgiven? Transgression is breaking the law. Are your transgressions forgiven? Are your sins covered by the blood of Christ? Are you blessed because you know that the Lord will never count them against you? Are you blessed? That's what, that's what Paul says, quoting from the Psalms. We can be blessed to know that our sins have been covered by the blood of Christ. We can be blessed because we know that God's not going to bring that sin up and hold it against me because he's completely cleansed me of that if you're not blessed in that way, if you do not have that understanding, we need to talk because that is, some, that is so important in our life. It's not about, oh, I'll go to church enough or I'll do this enough or I'll, hopefully God will be pleased with me if I do that enough. It's not about any of those things. It's about receiving that gift that God has offered through his son, Jesus Christ. So that's the first truth. You do not save yourself. God saves you. Truth number two. I can only bear fruit by the power of God. I can only bear fruit by the power of God. Now you might ask, but aren't I supposed to serve God? Aren't I, you know, doesn't the Bible talk about me doing his will and living for God and doing all of those things? Well, yes, it does talk about all of that. But again, we have to make sure we understand the foundation of all of this, okay? We are to do the things God tells us to do, but we are to do that by the power of God. That's God's grace in our lives. Now, again, that goes back to the title that I mentioned at, earlier. Can you force the fruit? Well, the answer is no. You can't force the fruit. Not if it's fruit of God at work, forcing it by doing it by yourselves. We can do a lot of stuff. We can be very busy. 
We can be involved in all sorts of ministries in our lives. We can do all sorts of things to clean up our life and live a better life. We can do all of those things, but it's not the same as producing fruit because producing fruit doesn't come by our own effort. Producing fruit comes, well, according to Jesus, by remaining in him. Let's just jump down again to John chapter 15, verse 4. We read that earlier. Let me read that verse again. Remain in me, and I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Now, let's say we get the idea of salvation correct. We understand it's the grace of God. God has given me God has called me righteous. I didn't deserve it. He did it. He offered that form to me. Okay. Then as a result of that, we say, okay, now I want to live for God. I want to do, I want to do what God wants me to do. I want to, I want to do my best at being a good Christian. I want to try hard at being a good Christian. Well, I appreciate the um, attitude, but you're setting yourself up for failure if you do that. The Bible says... Let grace flow through you. Let the power of God flow through you. Remain in Christ. See, salvation is to be in Christ. Okay, I, So I, I come to Christ. I'm now in Christ. Jesus says, well, remain in me. So as you are in me and I am you, then you can produce fruit. So it's not about, okay, I'm going to remain in Christ. Now, okay, now I'm going to go off on my own and, and just try my best to to, to, to make God please me now as his child. You know, and again, it's easy to get into this law thing, and it's, get, it's easy to get into this duty and obligation thing. But the Bible teaches us with that right understanding that I allow the power of Christ to work through my life. Now, you know, in the book of Galatians, in chapter 5, uh, it talks about um, producing fruit. And... It talks about having love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and self-control. It talks about having all these things. And if we just, you know, when I talk about bearing fruit, if we just focused on that out of Galatians chapter 5, about the character of our life, not about all the bunch of activities, but just the character of our life, that, you know, that'd keep us busy for a while. But, you know, in Galatians chapter 5, to, to have this character in our lives, it's called... The fruit of the Spirit. It's not called the fruit of my determination. But I think we've made it that. We've determined that I need to love more. We've determined I need to have more peace. I need to be gentle. I need to show more kindness. I need to have more self-control. I've determined that. You know, I've read it in the Bible somewhere. So I've determined I need to do that. But it's not, the, it's not called the fruit of my determination. It's called the fruit of the Spirit. That means I'm surrendering to the Holy Spirit and God's Spirit empowers me to love more and to be, and to show, and have peace and to be gentle and to be kind and to be compassionate and to be self-controlled and on and on and on as we go through that list of just character, just this, the, how my character needs to change. So it's not about me deciding I need to do this. Okay, Lord, I'm going to do this for you. It's remaining in Christ and allowing his spirit to work through me. Why do you think God gives us the Holy Spirit when we become Christians? Is it just so that we, have, we can say, I have the Holy Spirit? Is that it? Or is, as we read through Scripture, we recognize that God's spirit directs and empowers and helps and does all sorts of things. He does that in our lives if we let him. Not just, okay, I've got you, thanks. You stay over there, and I'm going to do my best for God. And we, and we set ourselves up for failure when you do that. Now, I know, I know many of you have been around plants and trees and bushes and things like that, right? And you've seen on these plants and trees and bushes, you've seen flowers and you've seen leaves and you've seen... Uh, fruit, and you've seen all sorts of things that, that, that are associated with, you know, these plants and trees and bushes. But here's my question for you. Do you ever hear a plant or a fruit tree grunt from exertion? Cotton plant? Have you ever heard a cotton plant grunt? And then all of a sudden, poof, 
this little ball of cotton shows up? Somebody says, yes, okay, I've never heard that. <laughs> you know, have you seen an apple tree? All of a sudden you're listening to the apple tree and boom, and all of a sudden this apple comes out. Do you hear a grunt of exertion that comes from these plants and trees, from leaves coming or, or flowers or, or, or fruit? I don't. Maybe I, my hearing is, is poor, but I don't hear that. Because, but I do know something, and this isn't sappy, but there's sap inside those plants. And as those plants and the branches are connected to the trunk or with the vine, the, the branch is connected to the vine, that that sap goes through that from the source into the branch and naturally produces a leaf or flower or fruit of some sort. It just, it happens as every, you know, as, as things are taken care of, okay? Well, that's, what it's, that's what's supposed to happen in my life. That I allow God to empower me so that, that he can change me and I'm not over here just trying to change myself. Now, there's always nuts and bolts to how all this works out, but we have to come with the right perspective. We have to have the right frame of mind about all of this and allow God to work through us Instead of kind of putting, okay, God, thank you for what you've done for me. Let me just put you over here, and I'm going to do my best to follow you in my life. Oh, I'm going to make you proud. You know, we, I think we go through Christianity this way. We misunderstand what the salvation is, and we misunderstand what bearing fruit is all about. It's about what God has done, how he goes, works through us so that we can bear that fruit. So how do we grow and change our character? The grace of God, his power in my life. How do we produce fruit? The grace of God, his power in my life. And oh, by the way, we'll see this in scripture. Grace is not just about my salvation. Grace is about my entire life in Christ. It doesn't come about just by trying harder. It comes about by understanding and allowing God's grace, his power to flow through me through his spirit in my life. So we need to know about the grace of God. We need to put our faith in the work of God. When he declares us righteous, we're just accepting that. We recognize our situation and we allow God to take care of our need. He's the one who's provided that. The Bible does say, yes, we are his work, workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. I recognize that scripture. I'm not denying that. But we need to allow God and his spirit in our lives to empower us to do that, to lead us to do that, um, to direct us in our lives as we are doing those good deeds. And there's a lot of verses about doing the good deeds, but it comes from the right foundation of the right perspective of remaining in Christ and, let, and allowing Christ to work through us. That is the grace of God. Let's pray. Father, I, again, I just come before you and just pray that as we think about your grace, that we would have a proper understanding, that we would know uh, what you have done, the promises that you have made, and Lord, that we just, we just receive that by faith. And, we, and, and Lord, we don't work for it, we don't gain your pleasure um, in that sense of uh, favor, we know that, um, that you love us and want us to be with you. And so we, we take that truth, Father, and I just pray that, that as we walk in our Christian faith, that, that we will live a life that um, is just submissive to you to allow your spirit to work through us. In Jesus' name, amen. There's so much to think about all of that. We'll keep talking about it uh, here and there, talking about what that all means to allow the grace of God to work through us. But let's come with the right perspective. And if there's a decision you need to make for Christ, if there's a prayer that you'd like us to pray with you, you know, just a, in a, the situation that you're in right now, uh, during this time of invitation, feel free to come forward and I'll be glad to talk with you and pray with you. So let's go ahead and stand together as we have our invitation song.
just mention a couple things before we head out. Um, many of you know about the homeschool group that meets and uses, um, uses our church facilities, part of the ministry of our church. They have a robotics team that's um, competing with over at TSTC and for all that stuff of the robotics, they do need to raise some support um, for that. Um, if you would like to um, help with that, um, you can contact Kimberly Baker or Amy Gilpin and talk to them about that to help our homeschoolers. On Wednesdays, we normally have our Wednesday um, dinner and fellowship time over in the youth center. We do that on a weekly basis. Well, this week, it's a little bit different. Um, the, the, in in the, um, the church, we have that all those bells and um, we've had them a long time. They need to do some work on them. And so they're raising some funds to, to restore all of the bells. And the youth bell choir is going to give a concert um, this Wednesday night. So there's a dinner, and the dinner is $4. Um, they have tickets in the back, or you can come on Wednesday night and pay for that. Chicken Alfredo, salad, bread, and a drink. Also desserts, and the desserts are going to be $2 uh, for a, a serving. And they want you to eat a lot and a lot of desserts. So... Um, Buy desserts, give desserts to friends, do all sorts of things, okay? Uh, we'll talk, talk about diabetes after that. And then, um, also you can buy the whole desserts if you really want to do that. So we're going to meet in there at 6 o'clock. Instead of the youth center, we'll meet in the fellowship hall. Um, we'll have dinner. Then we're going to come on in here, and the youth bells are going to give a concert. So that's Wednesday night. We're doing... This Wednesday is just a little bit different. And then um, tonight, we do have our evening activities, and... For Thursday night, we, with our, um, some of the work we've been doing with the nursery, we realized that we need to do some CPR training. So we're going to have a CPR training course Thursday night. So all of our nursery volunteers, we'd like you to come to that. If you want or need CPR training, you could come as well. There is a charge. Let me know, um, and I'll, let you, I'll get that information to you. Harvest parties coming up at the end of the month. There's a lot of information about that. You can... Um, uh, take a look at that, and also the, with the um, the church board. There's a, a group within the church board that's been assigned to to kind of work on a remodeling plan um, for the sanctuary. We've been doing it around the building in different places, and so we've talked about you know getting rid of the paneling, making some changes, things like that. Our our first order of business of doing all that is to make it a little brighter in here because it's, it's dark. If you try to read, um, you might have difficulty. Um, because of the darkness in here. And so where these lights are, we, they call them the coves, um, we're looking at bright, brightening that whole area up like threefold. I mean, a lot more light coming out, which makes a lot more light come to where you are. So that's the first step that we're going to take. And so we're working on that. We have the funds to do that part of it. Uh, but for the rest of it, we're going to we're putting a plan together, step by step, of what we want to do. We're, we'll present that and let everybody know, you know, what the plans are as we go go through all of this. But it's just, it's going to cost money. It's going to cost money to make some of these changes. So if the Lord puts it on your heart to make a donation towards the building fund, that's going to go towards the renovation project that we're working on right now. With here, up in the balcony, different places, all, all along in here, like with you know the walls, fixing that, all sorts of things. So there's a lot of stuff that we have plans that we want to do. Uh, we're going to put those, like I said, in an order of priority. And then as the funds come in, we will take care of those issues. And so if the Lord puts that on your heart, uh, it goes towards the building fund. You can use those little envelopes um, to do that. Okay, I think that's it for announcements. Are you going to have another breakfast um, after this? We had a breakfast announced after the 830s. We, I was not involved. You were not either because you had to be 20s or 30s. Yeah, sorry for bringing that to your attention. 
<laughs> and Albert was too young. So let's go ahead and pray and we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you for um, this time together. Help us, Lord, to, to do your will. But Lord, help us to do it with the right understanding of your spirit working in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.